I'm Joshua Becker, and this is the Earn and Invest podcast. There was a time when I became overly concerned with money. I had burned out of medicine, was exhausted by my life, and my sole focus became accumulating enough money to escape a life that no longer felt purposeful. When I reached this summit of all summits, the joy was instantaneous but momentary. Apparently, having enough money was nothing like having enough joy, connections, or purpose. It turns out that money was a huge distraction, keeping me from something deeper, something more important. My guest today says that I'm not the only one who has fallen into the trap of distractions. In fact, there are eight different forms of distraction, and those distractions are keeping us from the things that matter. Joshua Becker is the author of The Things That Matter, Overcoming Distractions to Pursue a More Meaningful Life, which will be on sale April 19th. He is the best-selling author of The More of Less, The Minimalist Home, and the founder of Becoming Minimalist, a website dedicated to inspiring others to find more life by owning less. Joshua, welcome to Earn and Invest. We are not given a short life, but we make it short, and we are not ill-supplied, but wasteful of it. Life is long if you know how to use it. This is the quote you started off your book with, and this is from a philosopher named Seneca. Tell me, that doesn't sound actually like the way I feel about modern life. Often, I feel like life is too short and it's going by too quickly. What inspired you to use this quote at the beginning of your book? It's funny. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me. It's funny because when you brought up the quote and I assumed you're going to ask me a question, I almost wanted to ask you after your intro, like, what does that quote mean to you and how does it strike you? Because my story is very similar in that I found minimalism and I found the joy of owning fewer things and how it frees up my life. And around that time is when I ran into that quote. And the juxtaposition of noticing how much of my life had been wasted chasing and accumulating material possessions and this quote that talks about, hey, our lives are long enough to accomplish the most important things. The problem is we just waste our lives chasing all these things that don't matter and we get distracted by by chasing needless luxury. And it was just this moment of, I, I see it, like I, I see it at a deeper level, how these distractions keep us from, from a life of meaning. So it was a, it was a, a quote that in the moment that I was developing as a person struck me. And then it became a quote that really formed the basis for this book, realizing as you point out to money, uh, and I talk about possessions, there are a lot of foolish distractions. There are a lot of short, there are a lot of temporal pursuits, uh, temporal distractions that can distract us from a life that matters in the long run. So I want to talk about those distractions in a moment, but it hits me that the book Things That Matter is built on the basis of the minimalism that you originally found, but it's not necessarily a book about minimalism. Let's talk for a moment about your journey. I want to read an excerpt from More of Less. And this is a description of a conversation you had with your neighbor. And I'm quoting you here. June could recognize the frustration in my body language and tone of voice. At one point, as we happened to pass each other, she said to me sarcastically, ah, the joys of homeownership. She had spent most of the day caring for her own home. I responded, well, you know what they say. The more stuff you own, the more your stuff owns you. Her next words changed the course of my life. Yeah, she said. That's why my daughter is a minimalist. She keeps telling me I don't need to own all this stuff. Tell me about that day. What were you doing and how did this message hit you? On that day, I was living in Vermont. We had had this long winter. It was Memorial Day week. We had the three-day weekend. My wife and I, we had two kids, five and two. I woke up and our plan on the Saturday was to do all the spring cleaning that we needed in the house. I offered to clean the garage, thinking that my five-year-old son would enjoy the project with me, which (laughs) lasted about 30 seconds. Was optimistic. (laughs) Yeah, right. Optimistic. That's a good way to say it. 
And uh, yeah, he lasted about a minute and he was in the backyard playing with his toys, asking me to come play with him. And uh, I, I just took the responsible parent route. You know, I can't come play with you. I need to take care of the house. I have chores to do. There's things that need to be done. And, you know, if you live in a climate with winter, you know how the garage gets over the, over the course of a winter. And so I started working on the garage and just one thing led to another. And hours later, I was, I was still working on the same garage. My neighbor, June, she was out doing her own yard work for hours. And I think we both just kind of sensed this frustration that we'd rather be doing something else. And so that's when that really life-changing conversation took place. And she introduced me to the, to minimalism. I remember looking at the pile of things in my driveway that I'd pulled out of the garage and spent all day taking care of. And I would have said, I think like everybody that my possessions aren't making me happy. I'm not looking for happiness in the things that I buy, right? We all say that out loud, although deep down, I think we actually are, but I could notice this pile of things And out of the corner of my eye, I could see my son swinging alone on the swing set in the backyard where he'd been all morning long. And suddenly this further realization that my possessions weren't just not making me happy, but my possessions were actually taking me away from the very thing that did bring me happiness in life and not just happiness, but meaning and purpose and significance and joy, um, which I think is the very foundation of minimalism that it's this further realization that our things aren't just not making us happy they're actually distracting us from the things that do which fuels this pursuit to own just the things i need so i can free up my money and time and attention and focus for things that matter now at that time you were not the joshua becker we know today from becoming minimalist but you were a pastor, if I recall. It's not like your life didn't have meaning and purpose at the time. Yeah, I I was a pastor for 15 years, even for about five years after that conversation and had begun the blog and had started writing. And so it is, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. It's a good way to say it because I, I don't think anybody unintentionally accumulates a whole bunch of things they don't need. Like, I don't think any, if you sit across the table from somebody and ask them, what do you most want to accomplish with your life? Like nobody says, I just want to own a whole bunch of clutter. I just want to own a whole bunch of stuff that I need. I don't even think anybody says, I just want to have as much money as I possibly can. Like we all talk about the same things. We, we talk about relationships and we talk about love and we talk about family and we talk about making a difference in the world. Like this is what in our hearts, our, our values are, are what we would say our pursuits and passions are, but somewhere along the way, unintentionally, we just get caught up in this messaging that we, we need to have more money. We need to have more stuff that, that, that more accolades and praise will make us happy. And I I think that, so for me, as we began clearing out the the things in our home and we got rid of about 60, 70% of our possessions, like it was just a moment of how did this happen? Like, how did this ever unintentionally become the pursuit of our lives? And so in a lot of ways, I say minimalism is about intentionality. It's about taking back control of, of my life and my values and um, promoting them to a greater degree than before. Let's talk about the book, Things That Matter. After the Seneca quote, you bring up Ronnie Ware and the regrets of the dying. And I'm like, OK, now is the smackdown. Now he's going to get exactly to that, that, you know, people on their deathbed are not thinking about money. And you did something interesting you bring up Bronnie Ware, but then you don't actually enumerate her regrets of the dying. Why did you decide not to put them there? You didn't really discuss them, but how do those relate to purpose? Yeah. Uh, thanks for noticing, by the way. I mean, uh, my I, I've used that article countless times in talking to people and in retreats and, and that sort of thing. And I, I never necessarily think, well, for me, I never think the the goal of bringing up that article, which went 
viral online. Like as soon as she published it, it was shared like millions of times and still is quite common. It was like one of the first articles I ran into online. And for me, I've always thought the the most important part of that article was not the five regrets that she lists out, but the idea of can I live in a way where I don't have regrets at the end of my life? And I think that that is what sparks the the popularity of the article. Every time I mention the article, the first question always is, well, what are the top five regrets? And I think that comes from this thinking of, I don't want regrets. Tell me what they are so I can avoid them. Um, and there's some reality to that. And I list them in the, in the appendix of the book, just because I, I think it's important in her observations. But for me, the, the whole basis of the book is about how do we live every single day focused on those things that matter most. And one of the chief ways that we do that is we, we identify the distractions that are keeping us from things that matter. And then we not just identify them, but we avoid them and we, we, we fight against them. We war against them almost every single day to keep those things that matter most to us at the, the forefront of not just our mind, but our, our money and our time and energy and focus. When we're talking about things that matter, e- your point is, and I think this is this a point that I truly agree with too, I think most of us are pretty able with a few simple exercises to figure out what really matters to us. Why don't we as a population pursue them more often? I mean, you talk about these distractions, you call them the enemy. I mean, is it that simple? Is it just that we get distracted from doing that which we really want in life? That is a great question. Uh, you know, I think that we, there are probably both the way I explain it is there are external voices that I think connect with some unhealthy internal motivations. And so in the world of minimalism, in the world of like just owning more stuff than you need, like there, there are commercials everywhere trying to convince us that we'll be happier if we buy whatever they're selling. But the way I always say it is that there's no marketer driving you to Target to to buy the thing. Like there's no advertiser clicking to ship on Amazon. It's a decision that we're making ourselves. And there's something, like there's some unhealthy motivation inside of us, the need to impress other people or jealousy or prove our success to someone or family member, whatever is like, there's sometimes just greed and selfishness. Like there's something inside of us. I think that that prompts us to pursue and get distracted by those things. I don't think they always just come up entirely internally. I think that there's messaging that we see from the from the outside you know certainly money and possessions are a big one and some pretty key chapters in the book but there's other topics that i get into but i think in probably each of those things there's there's some messaging from the outside that's that's connecting with something um inside of us along the way that that forces us to and forces in the right word that makes it too easy makes it too comfortable makes it too common that that everyone else is chasing these things. And so it just becomes uh, what everyone else is doing. And it's just so easy to fall into that. And it, it feels normal. It feels like what we should be doing, not realizing how much of a distraction it's become. Would you, would you agree? I mean, you, you come from a, a medical background. I mean, what, what have you seen in, in your life and, and in your world that, the pursuit of, I mean, I assume the pursuit of money is a big one in your field, the pursuit of possessions, the pursuit of accolade and accolades and reputation. Like it's a, it's a big one. What do you think, what do you think causes that? And just in what you've seen in your world? I think the biggest problem is that people don't necessarily know what they want. And in my opinion, one of the hypotheses I talk about in my writings is the fact that I think we are scared to death of dying. And so part of that is we don't want to do a lot of real thinking about what's most important to us because it's scary. And this idea that 
maybe I have these long-term goals and life and time is limited and I might not reach them. So as opposed to putting in the really hard work to do that, I think we go for lower hanging fruit. So I think accolades, I think short-term accomplishments, I think money are all low hanging fruit, which we can very simply organize our life to meet those goals. Mm -hmm. But I don't think they fulfill or sustain us. I think they're short-term solutions to a much broader, longer term problem of who are we and what's important to us mm. and what does a good life really look like? Ernest Becker, the the philosopher, he, he, he says, interestingly enough, he says, it's not so much that we're afraid of dying, but we're afraid of dying without meaning. And he says, most of man's pursuit of money, of property, even of reputation is his is his or her desire to outlive them themselves and uh, that this becomes, as you say, as he would say as well, I think. I actually, I'm not sure where he falls on the spectrum of if it's worthwhile or not, but that would, he would say that that was, that's what motivates us. And uh, I would agree. I think that those are some of the, the low hanging, the low hanging fruit. You know, it begs a, another interesting question is, is this a new phenomenon? And I'm going to quote you here again. Distraction from a meaningful life is a crop that has been growing abundantly as long as there have been human beings. I think it's easy for us to look at social media or look at the 24-7 news hype and say that this is new. Uh, but you would argue that this has been going on forever. Yeah, I, I would. Is 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 a, a little bit of me trying to trying to set the stage for the rest of the book. I, I certainly think that the the distraction of technology or uh, as i described just trivial like because it's more than technology but just trivial things um that that take place of the the more meaningful and the more significant that it's certainly i think a growing distraction although i'm sure when television was first invented they said the exact radio. same thing i'm sure when radio was invented they said the same thing or the, the, the telegram or the printing press for all i know like i, I think that it's not new in that way. But like, I really wanted to set the stage that, that this book is about more than just technology. Although, like I mentioned, there's a significant chapter on that. And so it's, you know, how do our, how do our fears keep us back from things that matter and past mistakes and money? I, I mean, I, I don't think you can ever look at a time in humanity where, where money wasn't the pursuit of, of people or being known by others. So it's, Certainly, uh, it's a, a a richer book, I think, than than I've written before, and I'm yeah, pretty pretty excited about it. But yeah, I th I think that, and I even go in the in the book and kind of list out, you know, philosophers from the past who've talked about distractions and the importance of overcoming them, and even how they have battled against distractions in their own life. I want to get a little more granular and actually enumerate the distractions because you talk about eight big ones: fear, past mistakes happiness, money, possessions, applause, leisure, and technology, as we just talked about. Let me ask you a personal question. Which one has been your biggest struggle? I mentioned in the book a little bit how much I, I, I think I personally struggle with accolades, fame, being, being known by others was a big, is a, a big one for me. Probably, I don't know if that's it's certainly the one that I struggle with the most now, although technology, I guess, is probably a pretty big distraction, but it was really a progression of, I think, like digging deeper and deeper into what, what was going on in my life because it, this whole journey for me started with possessions. Like, why do I own all this stuff that I don't need? Why am I wasting not just this Saturday morning taking care of my stuff when I should be raising my son? Like what, how did this happen? And then as I began owning fewer things, it started me down this road of what is the work of like what's the role of money in our lives if if the role of money isn't just to buy more stuff then what's the purpose of money and then once you're questioning money you can't help but wonder like what's the role of work in my life like if if i don't need as much money to buy all the things then how does work play into this? And is work still important even without the money aspect of it? So there's all this progression. And then I felt like I had kind of overcome this desire for possessions and was certainly battling against this desire for needing more money in these certain ways. And then 
I started finding myself wrestling with, hey, how come there's other people writing about minimalism that are getting more well-known than I am? Like, why is that happening? And suddenly this whole new aspect that, that honestly probably was in a lot of ways the root of all of these other issues in my life. I, I mean, no, it, it was, I, I have fantastic parents. I have a fantastic twin brother and I think that uh, they raised me well and they, and they loved us all. But my, my brother was always a little more well-known in high school and on the sports teams. And it will at least became financially more successful at a younger age in my life. And I, I think I, there's probably a lot of just family issues, great parents, like they did everything right, just internally of, gosh, I wish I was receiving the same praise from everyone that I see my brother receiving. And I think that that kind of fed into that, which then, hey, you know what? Well, how do I, you know, how do I get attention? Well, I, you know, buy a lot of stuff or I I have nice stuff or I'm successful in this way or that way. And so probably I think the the need to be recognized is probably at the the heart of a lot of issues for me. Yeah, this is like really good for me. It's a good conversation <laughs> I'm having here. <laughs> Talking about my family and my childhood. So thanks for, yeah, oh, this I, is great. I can as a form of therapy. So there <laughs> <Yeah>. you go. <laughs> oh, you're wonderful. Thank you. So we mentioned that you kind of came to this through one of those distractions, which was possessions and minimalism. You said one that you're struggling with or have in the past is accolades. Let's talk about society in general. Is one distraction more devastating than the others? I mean, when you look out, let's just talk about American society because that's easier. Is there one distraction you think we specifically struggle with more than others? No, I don't. I, I think that I think that they I think it looks different for every single person. And it was even the the reasoning for including the first two distractions that I cover in the book, the distraction of fear and the distraction of past mistakes. We did a, I did a nationwide survey for the, for the book, just asking a, a number of questions about, you know, what keeps, what do you feel is keeping you from your highest achievements and what is keeping you from pursuing those most important things in your life? Um, and sixty uh, percent of people said that their past mistakes are keeping them from their fullest potential today. And I, I think another fifty-five to sixty percent, some overlap but not entirely, would say that past mistakes of someone else committed against them, evil may or may not be the right word, just mistakes that have been committed against them are holding them back from from their fullest potential and pursuing things that matter or accomplishing the things that, that matter most to them. And uh, those were, and just the, the role of fear, all sorts of different fears that pop up in our lives. So I, I think that, you know, it, it probably looks different for, for different people. And I, I, I don't have kind of ordering the book was, there's a lot of thought into like, how do I, how do I order this in a way that makes sense? That doesn't show that one fear is more important than the other. I mean, I think that you have your I mean, I, I write about over consumerism and minimalism, you know, almost every day of my life. And so certainly I can see that. Certainly I can see the, the desire for money that we have in America. 80% of Americans say they'll be happier if they have more money. And I, I just don't think that's true. I, I don't think that you're going to be happier if you have more money. Early retirement is the new American dream. I remember CNN writing an article and that was the title and. I'm like, I, I don't, I don't know if getting out of work is really the the secret. I don't know if that's the dream that, that we should be chasing. Maybe we should just be chasing more meaningful work uh, rather than work that we can't wait to stop doing. So I think that at social media, of course, has brought up, you know, everyone's opportunity to be famous, regardless of who you are and where you live. If you have a, a cell phone, you can be famous, you know, and you can make the video that goes viral. And so I think that all those distractions show up at Probably, probably they all show up at different times in our lives, and there's probably more prevalent ones in different individuals' lives at any given time. We are talking to Joshua Becker. He is the best-selling author of The More of Less, The Minimalist Home, and the founder of Becoming Minimalist, a website dedicated to inspiring others to find more life by owning less. 
We're going to take a short break. I'm Doc G, and this is the Earn and Invest Podcast. All around the world, tech companies are innovating and driving returns for investors. Our crowd analyzes companies across the global private market, selecting those with the greatest growth potential, then brings them to you. From personalized medicine to cybersecurity to the $50 billion video and synthetic media industry, our crowd is identifying innovators so you can invest when growth potential is greatest early. Our crowd is the fastest growing venture capital investment community. Our crowd's accredited investors have already invested over $1 billion in growing tech companies, and many of our crowd's members have benefited from over 40 IPOs or sale exits of portfolio companies. Now you can invest in DID, whose patented reenactment technology uses AI and deep learning to turn still photos into videos for Fortune 500 companies and more. DID has multi-million dollar deals with movie studios, social media companies, and online genealogy platforms. Invest today at our crowd. Invest in DID at ourcrowd.com slash EAI. That's O-U-R-C-R-O-W-D dot com slash EAI. Join the fastest growing venture capital investment community at ourcrowd.com slash EAI. Let me reintroduce you. We are talking to Joshua Becker. He's the author of Things That Matter, Overcoming Distractions to Pursue a More Meaningful Life, which will be on sale April 19th. Joshua, we talked about this a little bit, but I want to come back to it. We're talking about these distractions, and it hits me there's a dichotomy, right? Some of these distractions are internally produced. And others are externally produced. Is one type more important than the other? And specifically, what do we do about those external distractions? Because, you know, I could see that we can change ourselves. I'm not sure what we can do about society. There are certainly small steps you can take to limit some of the external messaging that we get. The harder work is certainly the, the internal stuff, I think, because that's where we like that's where we have to realize, hey, I have been motivated by this. This is springing up from some unhealthy motivation inside of my life. But honestly, probably the the most important aspect of this internal external conversation is the realization that there's no change in blame is the is the way i say it if my entire thinking is i'm just blaming the messaging from the world i'm just blaming advertisers i'm just blaming the way my phone is designed or the way app makers or social media hook me to their platform like if it's just all about blaming them then I don't think the change ever happens um, that needs to take place inside of our hearts. And so at some point, just the realization, okay, Mark Zuckerberg isn't forcing me to log in to Facebook. Like there are things that, that happen on the platform that draw me there, but there's still something inside of me that's causing me to open the app or log in to the platform, whatever the social media or app might be. And so, you know, the, the book is about, you know, really, I think digging deep to discover those things, or at least making sure that we know that that, that journey is worthwhile. You know, I, I talk about minimalism. I talk about decluttering a lot and, you know, people, I, 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 I warn people as we're getting ready for this process, I'm like, Hey, don't stop when things get hard. Like when you can't get rid of the thing, that doesn't mean that you're done minimizing your possessions. It just means maybe you need to discover why that's so hard for you and if it's healthy or if it's unhealthy. And I think that that's where the change takes place and the most life can be found. I think one of the, I was going to say unspoken messages, but no, you kind of say this directly. One of the antidotes to these distractions, at least in my mind, is service to others. You use this term, the me monster. What is the me monster and how does it play a role in our distractions? Yeah, I have a, a, a whole chapter on happiness or a, a whole role, at least the selfish pursuit of happiness or where we are searching for happiness gets in the way. And, you know, I think the, the, the low hanging fruit 
as you so beautifully said, you know, is, hey, if I'm accumulating things for me, if, I, if I'm doing things for myself, that, that this is what's going to result in the, in the longer lasting happiness. And it, it just becomes, you know, something that we, that we feed into, you know, and I don't know if there's a whole lot of people that need to be convinced to pursue their own interests. You know, I think most of us are pursuing our own interests. It's, we need to be reminded to, to pursue other people's interests as well. And so that's why I talk about in the, the, that chapter. And I just love, I, I, it's one of those parts where studies back up all the things I think we know deep down that, that when we're giving to others, that when we're serving others, that when we're pursuing the interests of others and trying to solve problems in the world, that it will result in longer lasting satisfaction and fewer regrets about how we lived when we reached the end of our lives. And all the, all the science and all the studies back it up. In the book, I take a kind of a two-prong approach to these conversations where there are a a bunch of studies that show when we selfishly pursue these things, they don't lead to longer lasting happiness. And the other side of the coin that, that when we give to others and when we serve others, that it does lead to longer lasting fulfillment uh, and satisfaction with life. So yeah, that's why I talk about the, the me monster. It just becomes, it's like, it doesn't matter how much we feed it. It, uh, it just grows and wants more and more. Is there any easy way to differentiate between self-care and self-centeredness? Because, I mean, we should be spending some time on ourselves, correct? Yeah, I wouldn't disagree with that. I think it's, I think it's our, our motivation in doing that. Am I, am I pouring into my cup so that I can pour into others? Or am I just pouring into my cup so I can have as much as I possibly can? You know, so I, I would hope that or I guess I would challenge people. And I think that's something that most people would do or would think any wise, like I need to take some time away. I need to take some time for myself, not so that I can just take the rest of my life for myself, but I need to be building into myself and caring for myself so that I can be my best version in the world and make the, make the biggest impact, or at least accomplish the most good for the most number of people. So since this is a money podcast, I want to go back to this idea of money as a distraction for a moment. When you're talking about in the book, you say, but here's the thing with that saying, nobody thinks that they love money. When we hear a phrase like the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, most of us assume that someone else needs to hear that message. Why don't we recognize this trait in ourselves? Because I think we know that it is an unhealthy motivation or it is just the the low-hanging fruit. Like we know that our lives can be about something bigger than wanting more and more money all the time. And that there, there should be a level where we have enough money. And yet, it seems that there never is. And it's like, how, how come I don't ever feel like I've accumulated enough? How come this isn't bringing the happiness that I thought it would or the security that I thought it would? Is it just that I, I don't know. The idea of loving money, I think is, you know, pretty broadly looked down upon. And so I, I, as I phrase in the book, you know, none of us would admit that we love money. We just all want more of it, which I think is probably a less, I don't know, less difficult things for us to admit uh, or to say. I talked about this in the intro a little bit. Understanding what enough money looked like to me was a long voyage. And in fact, now in 2022, I would say enough money is the amount of money that allows me to pursue my unique purpose, identity, and connections, right? To, to be the best sense of me that I can be to hopefully do good things in the world. Mm -hmm. Tell me, what does enough money look like to you, Joshua Becker? What does enough money look like for me? Let me think how I want to phrase this. <clears throat> While you're thinking about that, I'll say there was a really interesting passage where you talked about getting the advance on your first book or one of your books. Mm -hmm. And a family ma member asked you, oh, so what are you going to do with the money? And, and I think you said, well, I'm going to set up 
a charity for or for orphans. Mm-hmm. And she looked at you and said, well, what about your kid's college education? And it, it was a really interesting conversation because I'm, I was listening to it with my mind and ears. And I was kind of there with your family member going, oh, that money, you could put it towards a college education. You could do all sorts of things, but that's not where your mind went. And that it made me really become fascinated with what you felt was enough. Yeah. Well, I had, as I transitioned into, so I transitioned out of pastoring and into full-time writing. And as a part of that transition, my wife and I had sat down to determine specifically, like, how much did we need to get by as a family? Covering basically just just the needs that we have the we had two kids so the you know the roof over our heads in the city that we lived in which varies from city to city the price and the food and our kids school and the work that I wanted to be doing and we had we had determined a number of how much we needed to get by we had determined a secondary number of hey it would be nice to have cell phones and it would be nice to go home and visit family over christmas and so there were like two numbers that we had had put together and my my blogging money was covering how much we needed to live and in came this uh book advance um money and i knew full well how lifestyle creep works how when you when you make more money and you start spending more money you you set a new baseline of what you need, what you think you need to get by uh, and what you think you need to have in in order to live the life that you want to be living. And, and we just decided that, you know what, we already had enough. This was extra income that, that was coming in. And so we, we used it to, to start a nonprofit called, called the Hope Effect. And yeah, different people, I think, you know, gave us different opinions about how to spend the money or where to invest it or what you know, mortgage to pay off or what college savings fund to set up for our kids. And I just, I don't know, I I guess I just refuse to live life that way. I I suppose my faith, you know, comes into, comes into play at, at that point. And just like, I mean, but if you think I use this money to go provide homes for orphans that, you know, when my son goes to college, there's not going to be a way to provide for that and and pay for that and just kind of refuse to get into that thinking that that I would overcome that. And I I don't know. I I think I just see it over and over again that we we get this dollar amount in our head that that once we save this amount of money or once we earn this amount of money that I'll feel like I have enough. And the reality is that we just never get there like it we get to that next level and we still feel like there's not quite enough money i don't have the the study in front of me but they did a a study of like the ultra rich people over like two million dollars net worth or 15 million dollars net worth i forget the specifics but i just remember they asked people how much money they needed to feel secure and regardless of where they were on the spectrum, they all answered the same, just a quarter more, like just 25% more from what I had. And I, I think that that's kind of the, the false promise of money or the, the, the false security that we expect money to provide. And uh, we just constantly get thinking that we, we need more, we need more, uh, we need more. So I don't know if that answers your specific question of how much is enough, but it was probably both just a a mathematical number of this is what we need to live. This is our mortgage payment. And then a, just a theoretical way of, you know, holding on to this isn't going to make us feel like we've, like we have enough anyway. While answering that question, you tangentially mentioned your faith. And I noticed in the book you did too, although certainly in this book, speaking around religion or faith is not a large part of what you present. How much has your faith shaped these ideas that went into this book? Uh, I think that everything I write is shaped by my faith, uh, shaped by my worldview, right in a way that 
is for any one faith or non-faith reader or background, but I, I certainly think that my my faith has shaped my view of the world, has shaped my view of of what's important. And I think that I it's interesting when you you know, I I, I write obviously I live in a, a Christian worldview and read a lot of Christian authors and from way back when and all just as being a pastor and you know, there's this there's this tendency, I think, by Christian writers to use their faith as the proof text for what is true in the world. You know, like, well, the Bible says this, so this is how we need to go on living. But because I decided pretty early on that my writing wouldn't be faith based writing, it would be it would come from that worldview, but not be faith based. I I found that I could just say, well, the you know, the Bible says this, so this is how we need to live. And it really sent me on a journey of like, what do, like, what do, you know, what does the, the science say? Like, what, what are studies saying about some of these things? And most of the things that I believe to be true are, are backed up by studies and Hey, like, we are happier at the end of our life if we're generous and and if we're selfless and hey look well the bible says that so i all that to say yeah I, all of my all of my books have been i kind of try to walk this walk this line of like i i tell people that this is my background and this is the you know the world view that i have i think it's going to come out in the book anyway but not needing to rely on my faith as the basis for the the points that I want to make because I think that the 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 truths in the book the the thoughts that that come up from the book I think are are valuable for any person regardless of their faith or or non faith background I hope you I hope you found the same to be true Yeah I definitely did I I was just trying to think of a metaphor that made sense to me but it it's almost as if if the science and the logic are the hot fudge sundae and the faith is the whipped cream and I I I don't say that lightly and in, in other words it's nice that the paradigm of the world in which faith exists and is important also can embrace the same logical and scientific arguments so that we all come out with an understanding and a structure for the world that's in agreement with all three. And so to me, I think it helps make these ideas and logic a lot more con concrete and a lot more approachable to people in general out in the world. So I see that as a, a very good thing. But I was I was very aware of the fact that you were careful that these were not faith-based arguments, which was appreciative to someone like me who probably sees themselves more spiritual and yet more secular. But I could definitely tell in your in your telling of this story, I would say, aha, th there's a man who faith is important to, but it yeah. didn't overwhelm the argument. Yeah. I got it from, uh, I forget the name of the guy who started Pencils of Promise, but uh, I was reading his book about starting the, the nonprofit. And like he was pretty early on in the first chapter, he just you know, described his faith background. I, I feel so bad not thinking of his name at the moment, but his faith background and how it played into his passion for writing this book and starting the nonprofit. And I think it just laid a, a helpful foundation for me in reading the book of, okay, I know where this guy is coming from. Like I know his foundational worldview, which I, I think added, added some weight, added some meaning at least to, oh, I see how he got there from from this worldview. And so I took the same in, in all three of my books. They're probably the minimalist home is the least of, of any mention whatsoever, but the more of less and certainly the the topics in this book of like, I think it's helpful if I just come out here at the beginning and like, this is who I am and this is how I grew up and this is what I believe. And so that you can kind of read that into some of the, some of the, yeah, distractions identify. And yet it's, you know, certainly helpful for, for everybody. A little bit like, Delivering clean water, I think, is the way I, I take it. Like clean water is helpful to people regardless of their faith or non-faith background. I think the ideas in this book are helpful as well. So tell me, Joshua, have your kids, are they at an age where they could read and digest things that matter? 
They have not read it yet. My son is a freshman in college. And so, yeah, I think that he can read it. My daughter's a, a sophomore. And so I think that he could, I think that he, I think that she could read it as well. I think that there's a, a, a greater weight that, that comes to the book when we've lived life a little bit more and, and kind of been in the, the career, you know, have, have begun pursuing some of those things as opposed to just pursuing the, the degree. But I have the degree now. What am I going to do with it now that I have this life in front of me? What am I going to spend it time chasing? Probably a little more that hit, hits home on some of these things once they've um, gone down that road. But yeah, I, I don't know. I guess I hope he reads it. We'll, uh, we'll find out. <laughs> Well, Joshua, I wanted to thank you for coming on Earn and Invest. The name of the book is Things That Matter. And certainly in my journey, I've spent a lot of time trying to parse out what is worth pursuing and what isn't. It's a question that we all face. We get confused on the road. There are millions of distractions. For me, money was a big one. For you, it might be technology. In fact, you enumerate eight specific ones. And it's really helpful to take a listen to hear to learn about what gets us off that path to happiness, to contentedness, to service, to making a different in the, difference in the world. I wanted to end this episode the way I end every episode by asking you what is up next in your life and specifically when does the book drop and where can we find it? The book comes out April 19th and uh, should be available anywhere and everywhere. And uh, what is up next? I'm I'm not sure. We'll see. We'll see how the book hits in terms of what what the responses are. I get out of it. My my second book, The Minimalist Home, came out of after the More of Less came out, and people were like, "This is good. Help us do this specific part of it." So we'll we'll see what happens. But pretty focused on the book coming out and enjoying your podcast and your incredible interviews. You do a good job. Thank you very much. The book is Things That Matter, Overcoming Distractions to Pursue a More Meaningful Life. And again, that will be available April 19th. This has been the Earn and Invest podcast. On behalf of myself, Doc G, I wanted to thank Joshua Becker. That's a wrap. Hey, everybody, just a little update on our ground team. The ground team is a chance for you, an Earn and Invest listener, to become part of my team for my book launch of Taking Stock. That's going to be during the first week of August. We already have almost 100 participants. If you sign up to be part of the ground team, you are going to get extra video. You're going to get snapshots into the book early, and you're going to get other content and blogs Become part of this community. Help me get this book out. Again, we're starting early because the ground team needs to be in place by early August. I hope you check it out. Just go to earnandinvest.com and right up at the top of the page, there'll be a place for you to learn more about the ground team. Come become part of the Earn and Invest and Taking Stock team. Thanks for listening. Awesome. Thank you. I, I thoroughly enjoyed this book. I, I really did. I think it put into words lots of things that have kind of been jumbled in my head for a long time. And I think I think it's where we are right now. You know, between COVID and the Great Resignation and all of this swirl and mass of change that we're all struggling with, I couldn't think of a better time to come out with a book like this. Well, I, I appreciate that. I, I appreciate any and every kind word that that I get of it you are you're uh, you're very thoughtful I can I can tell in the questions you asked and the the way you asked them a, a good healthy understanding of it and so I think receiving a compliment from someone who understands the book means means even a little bit more than a passing can't wait to read it loved your book you know that sort of stuff so thank you so much do you have a huge marketing plan are you going to be doing a book tour or is there any anything specifically that's going to yeah, we've been planning. We've been yeah, yeah. I worked pretty hard on the the marketing. Probably my my chasing of accolades, but hitting the New York Times is a bit of a bucket list. 
we'll see if this one pulls it off, but certainly that's the that's the goal and keeps me motivated, I guess, in, in some of that ways. But yeah, hoping to do a Midwest book tour. We did the West Coast for the first book and the East Coast for the second book. And so hitting the Midwest would be a lovely for this one, bring our kids and just see some cities and see some people. And well, if you come to uh, Chicago, let me know. I'd love to. Oh, I got Chicago on the list. I do have Chicago on the list. A bit, uh, we're a bit COVID tentative. Uh, yeah, it seems like yeah. things are starting to open up, whether by uh, force or by pleasure, but seems like, you know, who knows? And kind of trying to figure out those logistics as well. So 